Power to the Truth, this is Margo. This is Saturday, February 9th, 2019, and it is 4.29 p.m. Pacific Time. And what we're looking at today is uh, Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Services website, and we're going to be learning about nitrogen dioxide. I don't think we have looked at this before, and it is one of the pollutants or greenhouse gases that that we can track on CAMS, and it's another thing that adds to all of the toxic soup that's in our atmosphere. So I figured the more we could learn about it, the it, the more it'll broaden our horizon of understanding. And we don't have any new methane data here today, so <clears throat> we're going to look at nitrogen dioxide. And um, they have their data current on nitrogen dioxide, so I've gotten the base time chosen at for today, Saturday the 9th. <clears throat> I've got it for the global view and total column. And I already have this movie loaded up, so we're just going to run this, and then we're going to look at what nitrogen dioxide is and where it comes from and stuff. But I just wanted you to see it first. And as it's running through, the color ledger down here starts with this pale blue at one parts per billion, per million, sorry. Uh, then it goes, the aqua is 1.5 parts per million. Then the darker aqua is 2. And then the dark blue <clears throat> is 2.5. Then the forest green is 3. The olive green is 3.5. The light olive green is 4. The tan colored or cream colored is 4.5. This kind of golden color is 5. This golden tan color is 7. When you get into this tan orange range, it's 10. The red is 20. This dark red is 30. And this light dark brown to blackish color is anywhere above 50. And there's a 3 on the end here, and I don't know if they're, that stands, they just didn't have room to put the rest of the numbers, you know, whether it's 300 or 3,000 or what, but um, above 50 parts per million is this dark brown color. And so, um, again, the data starts from Saturday and then it goes into the forecast period depending on the data that they already have set up in their model. And what we see is, I'm going to, I just paused it there. When the sun is going ar uh, over around the planet, you're going to see the higher levels than when it's, when it's nighttime. Like it's nighttime over here in China, but we can still see high releases in China and India. So now let's let's look at what is nitrogen dioxide, where does it come from, why is it important that we know about it, and how does it affect our planet and our health and the health of other living beings on the planet. So nitrogen dioxide, this is from Wikipedia, or NO2, um, is the chemical compound for the formula NO2. It is one of several nitrogen oxides. NO2 is an intermediate in the industrial synthesis of nitric acid, millions of tons of which are produced each year which is used primarily in the production of fertilizers. At higher temperatures, it is a reddish-brown gas that has a characteristic sharp, biting odor 
and is a prominent air pollutant. Nitrogen dioxide is a paramagnetic bent molecule with C2V point group symmetry. And then here are pictures of it depending on the temperature that it's at. And at its, at its lowest, at minus 196 degrees Celsius, it, it turns into clear. It's co totally colorless, and it converts to dinitrogen tetroxide, or N2O4. And then as it warms up, it reverts back to NO2. And so here it is at the highest, um, this is at 50 C, 50 degrees Celsius. Here it is at 35, here it is at 23. So wh when it's, I'm thinking that's what can cause that brown color in smog in, in the atmosphere. So that's why you see see the air above cities that are really polluted with smog. We see it in this brown color. I don't know for sure, but anyway, here's a whole bunch more information about the compound and different stuff. And here are the, um, here are the properties. It is a reddish brown gas above 21.2 degrees Celsius or 70.2 degrees Fahrenheit and 293, 94.3 degrees Kelvin with a pungent acrid odor and becomes a yellowish brown liquid below the, the levels we just called out and converts to the colorless dinitrogen tetroxide or N2O4 below minus 11.2 degrees Celsius or 11.8 degrees Fahrenheit and 261.9 degrees Kelvin. Um, unlike ozone, the ground electric state, electronic state of nitrogen dioxide is a doublet state since nitrogen has one unpaired electron which decreases the alpha effect compared with nitrite and creates a weak bonding interaction with the oxygen lone pairs. Anyway, so that goes into a bunch of chemistry that I don't really understand. So, um, Well, let's go on anyway. The reddish-brown color is a consequence of preferential absorption of light in the blue 400-500 nanometer, all, although the absorption extends throughout the visible at shorter wavelengths and into the infrared at longer wavelengths. Absorption at, of light at wavelengths shorter than about 400 nanometers results in photolysis to form NO plus O, atomic oxygen, in the atmosphere. The addition of the O atom so formed to O2 results in ozone formation. So it's, it's, um, it's part of the uh, making of ozone. Anyway, um, it tells how it gets into, comes, um, becomes a nitric oxide with oxygen in the air and this and that. So, um, for those of you who understand chemistry and want to read all that, you can. So, let's go on down. It's used as an oxidizer. Consequently, it will combust, sometimes explosively, with many compounds such as hydrocarbons. 
so maybe oil um, I don't know um, here it talks about hydrolysis etc etc conversion to nitrites um, here's the ecology NO2 is introduced into the environment by natural causes including entry from the stratosphere bacterial respiration volcanoes and lightning these sources make NO2 a trace gas in the atmosphere of earth where it plays a role in absorbing sunlight and regulating the chemistry of the troposphere especially in determining ozone concentrations and the uses NO2 is used as an intermediate in the manufacturing of nitric acid as a nitrating agent in manufacturing of chemical explosives as a polymerization inhibitor for acrylates as a flower bleaching agent okay so they use it in bleaching flower lovely and as a room temperature sterilization agent it is also used as an oxidizer in rocket fuel for example in red fuming nitric acid it was used in the Titan rockets to launch Project Gemini in the maneuvering thrusters of the space shuttle and in unmanned space probes sent to various planets human caused sources and exposure for the general public the most prominent sources of NO2 are internal combustion engines burning fossil fuels outdoors NO2 can be a result of traffic from motor vehicles indoors exposure arises from cigarette smoke and butane in kerosene heaters and stoves workers in industries where NO2 is used are also exposed and are at risk for occupational lung diseases and NIOSH has set exposure limits and safety standards astronauts at the Apollo Soyuz test project were almost killed when NO2 was accidentally vented into the cabin agricultural workers can be exposed to NO2 arising from grain decomposing in silos chronic exposure can lead to lung damage in a condition called silo fillers disease historically nitrogen dioxide was also produced by atmospheric nuclear tests and was responsible for the reddish color of mushroom clouds so it's found in a lot of places a lot of places toxicity and then this here's a link to uh, nitrogen dioxide poisoning if you want to read more about it gaseous NO2 diffuses into the epithelial lining fluid of the respiratory epithelium and dissolves so this is the lining of your respiratory system like the lining of your lungs your esophagus um, things like that and chemically reacts with antioxidant and lipid molecules in the ELF NO2's health effects are caused by the reaction products or their metabolites which are reactive nitrogen species and reactive oxygen species that can drive bronchoconstriction inflammation reduced immune response and may have effects on the heart so that's where your bronchial um, your bronchial tubes inflame and you can't breathe uh, reduced, reduced immune response and heart problems acute harm due to NO2 exposure is only likely to arise in occupational settings well we'll see about that direct exposure to the skin 
can cause irritations and burns. Only very high gases, concentrations of the gaseous form cause immediate distress. 10 to 20 parts per million can cause mild irritation of the nose and throat. 20 to 50 parts per million can cause edema leading to bronchi bronchitis or pneumonia and levels above a hundred parts per million can cause death due to asphyxiation from fluid in the lungs. There are often no symptoms at the time of exposure other than transient cough, fatigue, or nausea, but over hours inflammation of the lungs causes edema. And it says for skin and eye exposure, the affected area is flushed with saline. For inhalation, oxygen is administered. Bronchodilators may be administered. And if there are signs of methoglobinemia, a condition that arises when nitrogen-based compounds affect the hemoglobin in red blood cells, methylene blue may be administered. It is classified as an extremely hazardous substance in the United States and is subject to strict reporting requirements by facilities which produce, store, or use it in significant quantities. So when you're talking these levels, so 10 to 20 parts per million can cause mild irritation of the nose and throat. So when we're looking back over here, 10 to 20 is this um, orangey gold color, which is this color up here in the northern United States and southern Canada. It's this color over here um, in these in these European countries and over parts of Russia. It's prominent over uh, a lot of China. So that's 10 to 20 can cause mild irritation of the nose and throat. 25 to 50 parts per million can cause edema leading to bronchitis or pneumonia. So 25 to 50, um, that would be from the red up to this dark brown. So over here, specifically in China is what we're seeing. So remember the article that I shared about the, the kids in Mongolia have gone out to the country during their winter break? so that they could breathe clean air and they were coming down with pneumonia. This is what they're talking about because the levels are so high it's toxic and I don't really think you can get it get it you know filter it out of the air or anything. I, I don't think so. I don't know what you can do. Wear a gas mask? I don't know. Um, but it would irritate the eyes and, and, you know, the nose and so health effects of NO2 exposure. For the public, chronic exposure to NO2 can cause respiratory effects including airway inflammation in healthy people and increased respiratory symptoms in people with asthma. NO2 creates ozone which causes eye irritation and exacerbates respiratory, respiratory conditions, leading to increased visits to emergency departments and hospital admissions for respiratory issues, especially asthma. The effects of toxicity on health have been examined using questionnaires and in-person interviews in an effort to understand the relationship between NO2 and asthma. The influence of indoor air pollutants on health is important because the majority of the P 
people in the world spend more than 80% of their time indoors. The amount of time spent out indoors depends upon several factors including geographical region, job activities, and gender among other variables. Additionally, because home insulation is improving, this can result in greater retention of indoor pollutants such as NO2, and so on and so forth. Um, it says a major source of indoor exposure to NO2 is from the use of gas stoves for cooking or heating in homes. According to the 2000 census, over half of U.S. households use gas stoves, and indoor exposure levels of NO2 are on average at least three times higher in homes with gas stoves compared to electric stoves, with the highest levels being in multifamily homes. Exposure to NO2 is especially harmful with children with that for children with asthma. Research has shown that children with asthma who live in homes with gas stoves have greater risk of respiratory symptoms such as wheezing, cough, and chest tightness. Additionally, gas stove use was associated with reduced lung function in girls with asthma although this association was not found in boys. Using ventilation when operating gas stoves may reduce the risk of respiratory symptoms in children with asthma. They also found um, using indoor um, gas heaters um, um, you know also give this stuff off Okay, avoiding NO2 toxicity. While using a gas stove, it is advised to also use ventilation. Studies show that homes with gas stoves, I guess they mean uh, gas heaters and, um, and other kind of and propane and all these others. If ventilation is used while using gas stoves, then children have lower odds of asthma, wheezing, and bronchitis, etc., etc. If venting isn't possible, then replacing gas stoves with an electric stove could be another option. Replacing gas stoves with electric ranges could greatly reduce the exposure to indoor NO2. So that's for cooking as well. It's important to keep gas stoves and heaters in good repair so they are not pol polluting extra NO2. And then, here's the end. They talk about the environmental limits. The EPA has set safely le safety levels for environmental exposure to NO2 at 100 parts per billion, averaged over one hour and 53 parts per billion averaged annually. As of February 6, 2016, no area of the U.S. was out of compliance with these limits and concentrations ranged between 10 and 20 parts per billion and annual average ambient NO2 concentrations as measured at area-wide monitors have decreased by more than 40% since 1980. So let's look at that. Let's look at these safety limits. So they say a um, hundred parts per billion over an hour and 53 parts per billion annually. So let's convert a hundred. So a hundred parts per billion converts to 0 0.1 par parts per million. So when we look at this chart over here, that's below the blue range. And I don't see anything below the blue range, do you? Because this this blue is one to one and a half parts per million. So what they're saying is this this um parts per a hundred parts per billion is a 0.1 parts per per million so i think 
I think they're off. I think they're off, and I think that we need to pay attention to the pictures that we're seeing rather than what the EPA says they've registered as everything's fine. Oh, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Everything is within limits while we're seeing um, all the way through the United States at least five to seven to ten, uh, ten and over parts per million. Um, we're seeing that right here. We're seeing that right here. Uh, and this is a total column. So if you want to go so if you want to go to surface level, if you want to go to surface level and check that out, then surface level level is a, is lower somewhat, but you're still got um, like a cream colored is the four four point five parts per million, and um, <clears throat> So now it went from gold to cream. So we're still seeing most of the United States in at least four and a half and over parts per million. And that's low compared to Europe and Saudi Arabia and India and China and parts of Russia. I mean, you know, I just get so upset. You know, we're we just lied to so much. We're just lied to so much. It just drives me crazy. So this is why we have to look at these things. And so, um, so if we see, like, um, let's take just this this basic cream color, four point five parts per million. Okay, so 4.5. That is equivalent to 4,500 parts per billion. So that's what we're breathing in. That's what we're breathing in is 4,500 4, parts per billion. And they say that um, it, you can, it's not safe to breathe a hundred parts per billion averaged over an hour or 53 parts per billion averaged annually. And they're saying that in the United States they don't have anything over what they what was it? Uh, 10 to 20 parts per billion. That was in 2016. Well, maybe it's gone up since then. Maybe it was that in 2016. And here it is 2019. Because that was February 2016. So that was three years ago. So maybe it went up. I don't know. I just found that interesting. So I will leave links below. And you can do your own research. And we can have a discussion about this if you want. But this is just one more thing to add to the toxic soup. And so in places where you see, uh, where you have a lot of cars and a lot of burning of uh, fossil fuels, you know, oil, coal, production of oil, you know, the usual stuff, just like where you have methane and carbon dioxide, the same thing. You're going to have nitrogen dioxide. And of course, don't, let's not forget the fertilizers. Look at all this red up here in China. So when, when you do it at surface level, it doesn't matter on wh what time of day it is, I don't guess. We don't see the sun moving across to change it.
So it's just one more thing and it makes ozone. I'm sure it makes this stuff makes the bad ozone. Oh, and look, it's uh it's um coming up here in the Antarctic too at surface level. See? Now this is uh here's the western um p peninsula over here is the Ross Sea and that this is the area like where that Mount Erebus volcano is so that could be being released from there but you know they've got they've got workstations down there they've got all kinds of stuff they're burning fossil fuels down there too so you know and we've got it in the Arctic. See? That's at surface level. So that, that could be from ships. I don't know. So there you go. So, let's pause that now. So that was our new lesson for today, our new area of study and we can be checking on that periodically so we'll leave this as a backdrop now let's go over to comments we've got a lot of comments because I didn't cover comments yesterday um, so we got comments from three videos now the uh, methane and arctic sea ice uh, video that was separate from one of my earthquake reports, the Southern California earthquake swarming. So Alfred Phillips leaves a couple of comments. He says, Think Wainwright, Alaska, Arctic Coast region, open lead water all winter. Okay, I'm not sure what he's saying there that maybe the water was open and it wasn't frozen all winter at the coast at Wainwright, Alaska. And then he says, will it affect bowhead whale migrating through Arctic coast region, Wainwright, Alaska? You know, I can't answer that, Alfred. Um, I'm, you know, I don't really study the marine life. Um, maybe someone else who's who's watching this video and reading the comments or listening can can help us with that um i don't know what what the whale do when they migrate so i'm i, I don't know but thank you for being here and thank you for for sharing with us and seymour rocks who's robin westerner says holy shit i've got to absorb this and he seems to be about the only other one who seemed really alarmed at by seeing the Arctic sea ice over by Novaya Zemlya just in pieces. And here it is in the middle of winter, and that's where the methane is coming up. And so now that the sun is starting to come up in that Arctic region, it's it's going to start heating up, and so we're the implication is we're in for a bad bad summer and a lot of methane being released and a lot of sea ice melting so thank you Robin for sharing and being here with us sensible hair says enjoy it cheers Margo I guess meaning the earthquakes in Southern California um, well I'm not in Southern California but um, I don't know. Um, I'm reporting. I don't know. It's my therapy, so I guess I'm enjoying it. Sensible Hair says under my methane and, and Arctic sea ice video. Oh dear. Cheers, Margo. So I think Sensible Hair understands what we're up against. Then Colin Shaw says under my Southern California earthquake swarming video. Dear Margo. None of us are what we think we are in reality. 
Humans waste their lives running after the sickly rewards of a crumbling society where empathy and consideration is far rarer than most choose to know. The soul in nature is fearless. The shallow intellect is the warden we allow to keep our soul locked away and ignored. The condition of the planet must be there, therefore be under the evil sorcerer's spell also. To be one with spirit is to be one with the entire universe. How sad we can't see it. I agree, Colin, and you know, this is this is what I talk about how we have such a disconnect with the spiritual reality of all of this and how you know the the soul of the earth it's the 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 soul of the earth is you know is conscious and aware is it's part of the greater awareness and the you know the everything so I agree and we've just been cut off we've cut off by going into the left brain where we think you know, we we think we can figure everything out but we can't we can't and in order to get into the um the the universal picture and um get into that spiritual realm um with the empathy and everything we have to get into the right brain and most people are locked in the left brain and so it's hard for them to get over over into that right brain so thank you for being here Colin and and sharing with us and holding the light then Tom Bell says uh, thank you for a really important informative report Margo and this was under my methane and Arctic sea ice you're welcome Tom Bell and he says I've also f just finished reading unless peace comes and wondered if you'd like me to send it to you as a gift as I know you have flagged this book up from time to time oh you're so sweet Tom you're so sweet to offer that but um, I think I'm gonna pass on that right now um, I've got enough on my plate and I'm afraid I'd get too depressed if I just sat around reading that book but thank you so much for being here and, and being a bright light over on on the other side of the planet and holding the light with us and witnessing all of this with us. I, I really appreciate you. And thank you so much for your offer. I, I really appreciate you very much. Sharon Thorpe says, great video Margo as always well thank you Sharon I appreciate it you're welcome and thank you for being here and then Robert Forsyth says Margo I know this methane release is going to continue to accelerate Russia along the Arctic tundra has lakes that are expanding these lakes are dark black they are expanding in size. Within them are anaerobic bacteria. These bacteria obtain their energy from the breakdown of organic matter underneath. The methane is released due to the anaerobic conditions within the lakes. These lakes can persist in their release of methane due to the heat produced with its chemical reaction even in winter. This is going to expand till no ice remains. About 230 feet will be the limit of sea level rise. I think you're right, Robert, and and you know, we've got big problems and it's not going to stop. It's it's just not going to stop. And so that's why we're seeing those black waves. Of methane just releasing just moving across the land over there in Russia along with those um, diatreme pipes so I mean it's a whole combo plate and then Dia Dimglow says very interesting um, responding to Robert uh, very very interesting I had a message given to me several weeks ago two words black river 
I just have started recording these because I get them and don't know what the application exactly is yet. Then I read something like this. Oh, thank you, God. I know he has shown me that bacteria is a growing problem, especially in cattle. So very, very sad. Our hearts are breaking parts per million. Absolutely, dear Dim Glow. And it seems that you are very tuned in to um, to getting messages and tuned in to um, what's going around, going at, going going on um, with the soul of the earth and with the planet and um, I too you know a lot of times I'll get visions but I don't understand what it means until I'll read an article or I'll see a video and I'll say oh that's what it's about and um, so so I'm glad that you were able to put that together as a result of Robert's Robert's comment there so thank you Robert and Dia Dimglow for being here and sharing with us we pr I really appreciate it and then sensible hair says under my um, video from yesterday methane sulfur dioxide and earthquake report thank you Margo so much happening now 2019 is going to be a most interesting year Yes, interesting indeed, sensible hair. Interesting. It's going to be full of full of changes, so fasten your seatbelt. Thanks for being here, sensible hair. And then Nostradamus, a.k.a. our friend Dave from the U.K., says, Hi, Margo. Thank you for your ongoing excellent reporting. You're welcome, Dave. I would like to share with you and your viewers a personal observation I've made recently. It has to do with the Thermosphere Climate Index, which is explained in this link. And then he leaves a link <coughs> to um, spaceweatherarchive.com. Basically, the index is expected to drop as we go deeper into the solar minimum. However, during the past few weeks, it has steadily risen from a low of about 3.20 up to a value today of 3.79. Therefore, my conclusion is that the atmosphere is not responding correctly to solar influences due to the sheer amount of greenhouse gases now prevalent in the air. So they're talking about the solar minimum as the uh, the sun goes through cycles of releasing sunspots or making sunspots, and so it's and um, so now we're at this point where we're at our lowest with with having sunspot activity, and certain things happen during that time, and so. Um, then um, Jochen Spalding, I think that's how you say his name, says this is correct. There's only a minor influence of sunspots to climate. On the other hand, greenhouse gases are very potent. So, um, so this is showing that the greenhouse gases and what's going on on planet Earth are overriding the so solar flare activity or non-activity that that in the past would have would have made a difference in our temperature somewhat but not now not now so thank you Nostradamus and thank you uh, Jochen for being here and for commenting and um, you know bringing in other areas of research to this and then Diadem Glow says um, under my SoCal earthquake swarming uh, says hi Margo I'm behind watching I did want to share with you before I forgot because I think it's real interesting that in LA they were having loud booms and then tons of black choppers and aircraft went into surveillance mode 
Now that to me is better than the usual bleak response regarding scientists scratching their heads, lol. Hope you're feeling better and hanging in. Thank you for your reports. Well, that's interesting about um, the loud boom and the surveillance mode in L.A. I did see a report that L.A. is running military drills. Uh, I mean, the military is running um, running drills in, in Los Angeles over the, over the weekend, I think. I th it was like a two or three day period. And it showed helicopters and you know, different stuff, and so I don't know if it was related to that or if it was something else. So thanks for your comment, Dia Dim Glow, and thanks for being here. Then Victor Cohen says um, under my video from yesterday, when certain people at Skull and Bones University make videos saying methane is not really such an issue you know you're hitting a truth spot yeah Victor I agree I agree and your comment is going to go right along with Robin Westenra's comment um, which I will go ahead I'll go ahead and share his comment and then I'll come back and finish up with these Robin, uh, who Seymour Rocks 97, left this comment earlier this afternoon. Folks might be interested in this dissection of a propaganda video denying the melting of methane clathrates. And this is what Victor is referring to. Um, isn't there an old adage that says something like, you never truly know something is true until the first official denial comes out? And so Robin did um, put together this blog post. Thank you, Robin, for doing this and for leaving this link for us. And he just put up this blog post about the Yale University releasing this propaganda video denying the methane clathrate gun. And um, anyway, he gives a history. Um, this is before that. This was an interview that... Uh, Natalia Shukova did, who was a Russian climatologist, along with her partner, and they they were the ones that went in on the Arctic expedition and did all the research and found the um, the methane hydrates um, in the East Siberia ice shelf and said it could release a 50 gigaton burst, and that's where all that comes from. So there's that as a background. And then here is um, um, audio of the clathrate gun being impossible because, uh, anyway, on and on. Yale Scientist goes out of its way saying nothing to see here on permafrost. And so he does this whole thing and it's really good. And he brings together uh, a lot of different comments and things. So, um, again... These are the um, these are the 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 um, priesthood. I call it the priesthood, who are trying to um, cover cover up or uh, make us think that things are not so bad, even though we see all this methane coming up in the Arctic and we're reporting on it every single day that there's new data and there. It's like when they say, oh, um, you know, that's not really enough methane being released for us to worry about. And it's red and dark brown in the middle of winter coming up through the sea ice. Hmm, I don't know. So thanks, Robin for, sh Robin, for sharing that. And people can go there and get up to snuff on the cover-up that's continuing but we know better because we are alert and discerning and we do our own research and you know I don't have I don't have anything at stake I don't have a reputation at stake I'm not a climate scientist I'm not going to lose my job 
I'm not going to lose my funding. I'm not going to lose... I'm not going to get demonetized because I was never monetized in the first place. You know, I'm on a mission from God. So, that's all I can say. So, I can show the methane as much as I want. Okay, so, Colin Shaw says... <clears throat> Uh, when we learn to live from the essence instead of the shallow intellect which acts and tells humans how to behave and live instead of the natural f spiritual forces, original cosmic higher arrangement, we fail to value and recognize nature's beauty and purpose to life. The poor earth is so neglected and poisoned by big business and careless humans which which refuse to wake up and respect their home. What we leave our children is a very certain legacy of troubles and hardships because certain humans love milking the planet. Rather than contributing some affection and caring for its better good and trouble-free continuance in as best we can. What does money and profits have to do with our souls? Keep the information rolling. Much thanks, Margo. Thank you, Colin, for sharing that. That was, uh, I can see that's very heartfelt. And I agree, you know, we have to come from a spiritual perspective. And I think the that these humans that you're talking about, um, who are milking the planet, they're not human. I've already talked about that. I don't think they're human. They're not human with a soul, so that's just my opinion. So thank you for being here, Colin, and sh thank you for sharing that. And then um, these comments came in uh, under my video from yesterday. Tom Bell says, thank you, Margo. You're welcome, Tom Bell. And then D. Drake, one of my friends over on Facebook, says, thank you so much, Margo. Your perseverance is admirable. Well, you're welcome, D. Drake. And thank you for being here. And thank you for cheering me on and giving me an atta girl. I need that. It's not easy to be here day in, day out, day in, day out. But it is my therapy. So, um, that's all of our comments for today. So, I'm going to close this out. <clears throat> And now, let's look at earthquakes. And it's the weekend. And so, as we know, on the weekend, a lot of the earthquake makers who go out and do explosions and quarry blasts and underground experiments and blowing up stuff and tunneling, they're taking the day off. And so, usually Saturday and Sunday, we see lower numbers of earthquakes. But we're still seeing significant activity. So, it is now 521 as I start this part of the report. And so, I have USGS pulled up all magnitudes uh, for the last 24 hours worldwide. We're seeing 195 earthquakes worldwide. If we go over to the two and a half magnitude worldwide, we have 29. So let's see which ones are the oldest, and we'll start with those. Okay, um, it looks like we don't have to worry about that because the oldest one, uh, the oldest one here is came in at um, 616 last night so uh, we don't have to worry these these are all going to be on the map for a while so let's start where would I like to start today let's start with this earthquake right down here between Madagascar and Africa We've seen we've seen them before here. This was a 4.7 that came in near Pamansi, 
Mayati uh, came in last night at 11.30 p.m. in the ocean right between the upper end of Madagascar and the east coast of Africa there and then moving on up we have this one in Iran a 4.8 that came in um, today at 1.26 p.m. 38 kilometers southeast of Majed Solomon, Solomon, um, Iran. So it looks like it's not really near anything. There's the town they were sighting. <clears throat> so that probably didn't do any damage. I mean, it could, if if there were poorly constructed buildings nearby. Now down here in Indonesia, here's one right off the coast of northern Sumatra, uh, 4.7 near Sigli, Indonesia. This came in at 121 this morning, 146 kilometers deep. So since that was in the ocean, it probably didn't do any damage there. Now, coming around, remember we saw a swarm down here at General Luna. Was this yesterday? We saw like nine or ten, or a whole bunch down here. So here's another one, a 5.2 um, near General Luna in the Philippines. This came in today at 2.21 p.m. this afternoon, right on this red line. So it was in, again, it was in the ocean, so probably didn't cause any damage. Then moving on down here over to the, um, this area, the Tonga area, we've got a 4.8 near Sagavi Wallace and Futuna. This came in at 3.01 p.m. this afternoon. These are all Pacific time because it's easier for me to think like that. It's my time zone. 360 kilometers deep. Remember the deep ones will cause the tectonic plate movement around the planet and you'll see magma moving. Or evidence of magma moving. You won't see the magma moving unless it's coming up in a volcano. And here's a 4.9 near Nadoi Island, Fiji, that happened at 7.03 this morning. Quite deep, 561 kilometers deep. So there's those. Now let's come on up here. Here's one. On this little island, this is considered part of Russia. It's actually on the island. It was a 5.0 that happened, um, they say 28 kilometers southwest of Yuzhno Kurilsk, Russia. This came in yesterday at 6.24 p.m., 112 kilometers deep. So I looked at it on uh, global uh, Google Earth and it didn't look like it was near any towns so it probably didn't do any damage but it's just showing movement <clears throat> and that's that's in, you know part of this island chain here now um, let's move on over to South America they've got some interesting things going on here down here off the coast of Peru, uh, 4.4 4 near Pimental, Peru. This one came in last night at 7.20 p.m., 72 kilometers deep. Then here's one on land in Peru, a uh, 4.4 4 near Ayaviri, Peru. 
This one came in at 1216 this afternoon, 181 kilometers deep. Then down here, we've had, um, well, let's get the first one. The first one was a 4.7 near Coloma, or Coloma, Chile, Chile. This one came in at 3.11 this morning, 136 kilometers deep. Then a 5.1, same place. This one came in at 11.23 this morning, 121 kilometers deep. And then, not too far away, was a 4.2. Um, this one came in at 3.40 this afternoon, 103 kilometers deep. So here's the town that they're referencing, the Kalama. And so um, here's, here's a road that this 5.1 was next to. So, it, I don't know if it did any damage or not. We'll find out. And then, right at, th almost on the tip of the southern edge, right in this little inlet here, this little bay here, was a 4.4 near Punta Arenas, Chile. This came in last night at 6.37 p.m. 16 kilometers deep, right there in the water. <coughs> oh, and it's extremely warm down there. If you look at Climate Reanalyzer and do the 2 meter temperature anomaly, it's red down here on this tip. So this was on this red line here. So that is that is an active zone being on a red line. Then here off the coast of El Salvador we had a 4.1 near Puerto El Triunfo, El Salvador. This one came in at 2.03 this morning. <coughs> So I think that's all of the international earthquakes. Now, let's look at Dominican Republic. We're seeing three here that were above 2.5 magnitude. There's a 2.6, 3.0, and 3.2 is the highest. These were all in the ocean. So let's go to all magnitudes. Uh-oh, was this a new one? Well, we'll look at that when we come back. <coughs> That's a new one that just came in at Indonesia. Well, well, lo let's look at Dominican Republic and then we'll look at that new one in Indonesia. <coughs> so look how it's calmed down down here. Remember we had like 20 or 30 down in this region each day in the last few days and it was swarming here. So today, there are only four showing in the last 24 hours. And the, the, the largest one was this 3.2 and the smallest one was this 2.1. So, so for whatever reason, things have stopped moving or calmed down for a little while down there. Now, let's hop back over to Indonesia, and the, we've seen them down here before, um, near Tobolo, in, in the ocean here, um, a 5.0 near Tobolo, Indonesia, this came in, just came in at 5.08 p.m. Pacific Time, 60 kilometers deep. Look, and we just had another one. A 4.6. We've had two. 
Oh, they they just now put this one on the map. There was a oh 4.6. There was a 4.6, but the 5.0 got on the map before or got registered before the 4.6. So there was a 4.6 <clears throat> at 506. That was uh, 35 kilometers deep. And then a 5.0 at 50, 508, so two minutes later, and this one was 60 kilometers deep. So we'll be watching and see if some more come in while we finish up with the with, uh, United States. <clears throat> wow. Things are happening. Things are happening. The Earth is coming undone. Okay, then in the Aleutian Islands, uh, we had a 4.4 .4 near Atu Station. These are all part of Alaska. This came in at 2.34 this morning. Then over here was a 4.1 near Amukta uh, Island, Alaska. This came in at 6.18 this morning. Here was a small one right on the red line, a 2.3 near Kodiak, Alaska. This one came in at 3.56 this afternoon, zero kilometers depth. Here's a 3.4 near Chignik Lake, Alaska. That one came in at 6.21 this morning. 3.0 on land near Chignik Lake. This one came in at 2.43 this afternoon. <coughs> well, let's go to 2.5 magnitude and higher and see if we can get those, get all of those first. I just showed those two. Then here was a 2.5 near Talkeetna. And a 3.6, that's the highest one so far, near Kobuk. That one came in at 8.37 last night. <coughs> so when we're looking at Alaska and trying to see how many came in in the Alaska area in the last 24 hours. Get them all on the map here. 73. So they average between 50 and 100 a day. So here's this one over here. A 2.1 near Juno. Well, 55 kilometers north of Juno. I didn't know Juno was over there. Anyway. So then when we zoom in, uh, in this area we've got 60. So the majority of them are clustered around in this anchorage area and then peppered around. <coughs> so they're, they're small. Most of them are small ones and twos. <coughs> But again, the small ones, you get enough small ones built up and it creates weak parts in the, in the, in the plate. And then when the magma starts flowing, it'll come up. Okay, now in the lower 48, let's look at Yellowstone. We've got two to report on up here. We had a 1.2 near Virginia City, Montana at a minus 0.2 kilometers depth. And we know that that means with it being a minus depth or a negative depth that the epicenter of the earthquake is up in the mountain and that that's usually from magma flowing and moving up into the chamber of maybe an old volcano. 
<clears throat> so there's that. And then a 1.4 near Manhattan, Montana. So we got two being reported over there. Now coming up to the Washington area, <clears throat> Washington and Oregon. Now remember we saw a microquake at Mount St. Helens yesterday. That was a new experience for me. <clears throat> So here we've got four on the map. There might be one more. Here's a 1.2 near Mount Hood and there's a volcano. It's not at the volcano but it's near Mount Hood Village. Mount Hood Volcano is right up there. But we had a 1.2 at Mount Hood Village. A 1.4 near Goldendale, Washington. A 1.9 near Morton and a point seven near Morton. So Morton is up here in case you can't see those. And then did we get this one? Oh uh, yeah, that's the Mount Hood. Yeah, we got okay, so we got all those. So now let's come on down, see what's going on in Northern California. Here's one near Eureka, um, at near Blue Lake, a 2.9 that came in at 12:30 this afternoon. And then we look, we got three in a row over here, and one right in this little lake. And here's a 2.9 near Montgomery Creek. A 1.8 near Viola and a 1.3 near Chester. So we got four right there. So that's more than we usually see there. So we got all those. Here's one north of Ukiah, northeast. Uh, 1.6 they say near Redwood Valley. And then let's look at the geysers. We've got clustering down here today. 16 on the map today. And they're in the ones, ones and under range, it looks like. Now let's move on over to, let's cover Nevada. I don't think there's much going on in Nevada. Like I said, the earthquake makers are at home. Here's one lone one down at Hawthorne, a 1.8. Here's one right on the state line, a 2.6 near Quails Camp. And here's one that just came in, a 2.1 near Alamo, and a 0.7 near Warm Springs. And then here's a little tiny one. Minus point two near Beatty. That was a microquake. And here's one west of Las Vegas at Perov for 1.1. That's it for Nevada. So let's come down our San Andreas fault line. And here's a 1.4 near Danville. Here's a 1.3 near Gilroy. So coming down, coming down, coming down. Now we're getting into the Los Angeles area, Southern California. Let's look at Ludlow real quick. Remember it was swarming down here. We saw a 66 last night that had happened in the last 48 hours. And so in the last 24 hours, they've had three more so it hasn't stopped, it's slowed down. There was a 2.0, 1.6, and a 1.2. So um, that was all this, this morning. Um,
they stopped. We haven't had anything since 325 this morning at Ludlow, near Ludlow. Ludlow's over here, but they're calling it near Ludlow. So, let's see what else is in down here. Okay, nothing in across the border. Let's see what we can get on the map here. I'm going to try and take Ludlow off. 41 all in this viewing area here. So they're just peppered around. I remember we usually see a bunch at Kawea and um, not too many though. A few, like nine right there. But we also are still seeing some down here at Salton Sea. I didn't, I should have reported on these when was it yesterday? I saw a cluster of like eight or nine right down here, but I I forgot to I, I saw it after I did the report. But what we can do is go to um, seven days all magnitudes and look at all of them that have shown up right in this area. Yeah. This is where they were clustering. There are 15 in the last seven days. Right down here. And, and uh, most of them, well there were four of them. One, two, three, four on February 3rd. And then, then they started up on February 7th. And then the 8th. The 8th yesterday was when I saw that cluster after I did my report. So there's that. So I'm going to turn this back to one day. So now let's come up. Um, let's come up this east side of California and we'll wrap it up. There's a point eight near Ridgecrest, one point five near Isabella, Isabella. Now at Mammoth Lakes, we've got four. The largest one is the one point seven, and no negative depths there. And I think that's a wrap. I think so. Let's back out. Let's see what else might have happened. Um, the the last ones were the these uh, ones down here in Indonesia the 5.0 and 4.6 at the same place and I did I, we did get those so I think that's a wrap so I will end it for today and I do believe time is very short and that we are in the end times and I recommend everyone get their spiritual houses in order Get right with God and Jesus while you still have time. So I love you all very much. And until next, year, next time, God bless everyone. And I'll talk to you real soon. Good night.